So hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Norman Ho, uh, and welcome to STL, or Peking University School of Transnational Law, to this public lecture in our STL public lecture series. I'd also like to welcome those of you who are joining on Zoom. We're very privileged today to have as our speaker, uh, Professor Gerard McCormick, who serves as Professor of International Business Law at the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom. Uh, he also previously taught at the University of Manchester and has served as Dean at the School of Law at the University of Essex. His research interests are in corporate and commercial law with an emphasis on insolvency law from an international and comparative perspective. He's the author of various articles and books. His most recent uh, monographs uh, in insolvency law include the European Restructuring Directive, uh, that's uh, one recent book, and another recent book that came out, uh, EU Insolvency Law, Cross-Border Insolvency Law in Comparative Focus. And Professor McCormick will speak to us today on the topic of discharge and modification of debts under English and Hong Kong law. Uh, Professor McCormick will speak for approximately 40 to 45 minutes, after which we will open the floor uh, for questions and discussion, uh, obviously both from in-person participants and also people on Zoom, feel free to mm, ask questions during that time as well. I would like to give the floor now to Professor McCormick. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Norman. It's a great honor and privilege to be here in Shenzhen to, be, uh, to speak at the STL and to special thanks to Professor Ho, to Professor Asif Qureshi, and also to the Dean, Professor McConaughey. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm giving it the Scots-Irish pronunciation because I assume from the name, um, Professor McConaughey is of Scots-Irish heritage. Um, I myself am of Irish heritage. I wouldn't claim to be of Scottish heritage, but I have many Scottish friends, so no disrespect to any Scots here, either by origin or by heritage. Um, okay, you know, as I said, it's a great honor and privilege to be at STL, and I'm gonna talk about discharge and modification of debts under English and Hong Kong law. Um, okay, so I'll move on to the next slide. <laughs> UK restructurings, what are basically UK restructurings? Well, they're basically the modification and discharge of debts. Um, big international law firms now in the UK have what they call restructuring departments. You might say, how does that compare with, with the United States? Well, there's a slight difference in terminology. In the United States, they use the expression bankruptcy, whereas in the UK, we're very polite. We don't talk about bankruptcy, we talk about restructuring. Because there is some possibly rude Americans, I don't want to say rude, but some Americans like Donald J. Trump have used the US bankruptcy process to their own advantage. Well, I'm not criticizing uh, President Trump or former President Trump, I'm just saying this is a fact of life. Whereas in the UK, that's not quite the way things are done. We use more delicate language. We would talk about restructuring. So, a little bit of comparison. So, language, even if you're using the English language, doesn't um, translate exactly across jurisdictions. And I should say also um, that in Hong Kong, I suppose because of the traditional, or some say the British colonial inheritance, law firms, big law firms, tend to use more the British terminology. And Hong Kong law, obviously two, um, two systems, one country, um, to some extent uses its UK inherited law. So um, restructurings and what I'm saying in relation to England and the UK would also apply in the context of Hong Kong. And I may make some Hong Kong references uh, as I speak a little bit more. Well, 
I talked about restructuring. What does restructuring of debt mean? Well, you could say typically there are three elements. Firstly, there's a moratorium. There's a, a bar on the enforcement of debt. I've used the Latin word moratoria, and I'm not quite sure whether I should say moratoriums or moratoria. That means uh, restrictions or bars on the enforcement of debt. So that's one situation. Um, another expression that's sometimes used by lawyers is loan stretchouts. What does a loan stretchout mean? Well, it basically means extending the repayment period, or to use more legalistic terminology, extending the maturity of loans, extending the repayment period. Haircuts. Well, I don't need to bother so much anymore with haircut because I don't have too much hair. Uh, but some people here have much more hair than I have. So um, haircut means basically cutting down, reducing the capital amount that has to be repaid. So let's assume I owe 100 and the creditor, uh, the debtor says, well, I can't pay the creditors 100. Let's cut down the capital amount that has to be repaid to 70. That's a haircut. But obviously, some lenders don't want to take a haircut. They say, we can't reduce the capital amount. It's better to stretch out the repayment period. So you don't want to take a haircut. But haircuts can happen. Another feature of a debt restructuring could be, low, uh, could be a debt equity swap. What I mean there is converting the debt into shares in the, in the um, uh, converting the debt into shares in the debtor company. So you convert the debt into shares in the debtor company. And this can happen. Obviously, it, it, you know, some lenders don't like it, but if the alternative is not getting paid in full, you might think, well, I'll take shares in the debtor company in return. Um, well, in the UK, um, and this practice has developed over the last 20 or more years, restructurings are done generally by means of schemes of arrangement under Part 26 of the Companies Act. You might say, Companies Act, that isn't insolvency. Ah, I said we're very clever in the UK. We don't like the word insolvency or bankruptcy. We prefer Companies Act. So it's a corporate procedure, it's company law, it's not insolvency law per se. And it's not necessarily a collective procedure, so it doesn't have to involve all the creditors. It may um, not involve all the bondholders or all the other creditors, it may only involve some of the creditors. So there may be particularly troublesome debt you want to reduce. Um, so debt restructuring in the UK is generally being done by means of a scheme of arrangement under the UK Companies Act. But I should also say that schemes of arrangement can be done in other situations. They're sometimes used by corporate lawyers in a takeover situations where they're used to squeeze out minority shareholders. Um, well, what's the advantage of doing debt restructuring in the UK by means of uh, schemes of arrangement. Well, we're very ca cautious about language in the UK. We're not Americans. We're not Americans. We're polite Brits. So we use sensitive language. So um, there's no insolvency stigma. You don't say the company is bankrupt. You say it's using a corporate, ins a, a corporate uh, act procedure. So it's a corporate um, procedure. So no insolvency stigma. You don't need to think about nasty words like um, you don't need to think about nasty words like insolvency. Um, okay. And you might say um, okay, let's do a, an English scheme or a UK scheme. Is there any problem with get international recognition? Well, Well, I'll approach that question a bit sideways. You could say, well, you don't, uh, 
Sometimes UK schemes, often they're used for foreign companies, companies incorporated outside the UK. So you, you use a UK scheme. The question might be, do you get automatic recognition of the UK scheme abroad? Yeah, hello? Just a question Well, as I said, you could extend the period of repayment of the debt. Well, there are different tactics used in different situations. Um, in, I won't go into, uh, and probably you know more about this than I do, I won't go into uh, corporate procedures, but basically, in under the UK um, takeover code, if you use it by means of a buyout uh, from a different bidder, you can only take out if you get 90% acceptance. So you have to have 90% of the company being taken over the shareholders to accept. But by means of a scheme of arrangement, if you get 75%, so it's an alternative to use, uh, to you uh, rather than a straightforward takeover bid, um, to use a scheme of arrangement. And in a very big mining company case, the name of which escapes me now, um, um, the big operations, um, that was used because they didn't think they would get 90% acceptance, 75% if they used scheme of arrangement, they could do it. And um, it was basically, um, it was basically, it's more complicated using by means of a scheme of arrangement, but if you can't get a 90%, well, you have to do a scheme of arrangement. Okay, so I'll just move back to insolvency area, if that's okay. Thank you very much indeed for the useful question. Um, Okay, we Brits like careful terminology, and sometimes we approach things separately, you know, indirectly. Um, well, you might say these schemes, are they automatically recognized throughout the EU? Because it's often used for foreign companies. Um, well, no automatic recognition under the European Insolvency Regulation. The UK was part of the European Insolvency Regulation when it was a member state of the European Union. Um, but of course, Britain has now left the European Union. I won't explore that point. Um, so there was no automatic recognition, but it was generally accepted you could achieve recognition throughout Europe uh, because it was regarded as a judgment or order, which would be a proved under the Brussels I regulation. As I said, generally accepted, uh, but to approve a scheme of arrangement, the UK courts would accept evidence, and often there were evidence produced by foreign law firms, foreign lawyers, foreign university professors, that the UK scheme would likely be recognized abroad, be abroad and produce benefits for creditors. So the UK courts would be satisfied with that. They would approve a scheme for a foreign company if the company had sufficient connections with the UK and there was evidence before the court that the UK scheme would be likely recognized abroad and it would produce benefits for creditors. Okay, so very flexible. Um, as I said, um, <laughs> UK schemes and foreign companies um, the jurisdiction of the UK courts, the English courts, to approve schemes, schemes were not, was not subject to the constraints of the insolvency regulation. So it need not be established that the company that, whose debt has been restructured has its centre of main interest or an, even an establishment in the UK. Uh, the UK courts adopt a fairly flexible test which is known as the sufficient connection test if the company is deemed to have a sufficient connection with the UK. And you might say, um, what is the sufficient connection? Well, it's flexible. Um, it could mean that the debt is governed by UK law, and because London obviously is a major international financial center, a lot of foreign companies have entered into loan agreements with the debt governed by UK law. Um, also, there might be a UK jurisdiction clause stating that the 
relevant parties to the loan agreement have accepted jurisdiction of the UK courts, or in fact there might be evidence that some or all of the bondholders, the debt holders, are resident in the UK. Um, you might say schemes of arrangement and foreign law. Hmm, slight complication here. Um, there's a general principle of English private international law that modification of contractual ob obligations is governed by the proper law of the contract. So if we've got a loan agreement and it said it's subject to UK uh, to English law, then before you can modify that loan agreement, it has to be done under English law. That's known as the Gibbs principle. So that basically means if there's a loan agreement governed by foreign law, uh, sorry, if there's a loan agreement governed by English law, the modification of that loan agreement under foreign restructuring law would not be recognized in the UK, in England, unless there was a submission to the UK jurisdiction. In other words, the parties accepted in a particular case that they would accept the jurisdiction of the UK courts or some other regime such as the European insolvency regulation applied. You might say, we Brits, I said, are very careful people. But sometimes the Americans say, you Brits are hypocrites. You Brits are hypocrites. And could I give you an example of apparent British hypocrisy? Of course, the Brits are never hypocrites. So Americans are wrong. But some people would, would point to this case, the Magyar Telecom case. This was a telecom company and I, um, a European incorporated another European country. And in that case, the UK courts approved a scheme in respect of New York law governed bonds, New York law governed debt. You might say, surely that's hypocritical because it's approving a scheme in respect of UK, uh, sorry, New York governed bonds. Ah, we Brits are not hypocritical. We will accept evidence if there was evidence that the scheme would likely be recognized in the relevant foreign jurisdiction. And before the Magyar Telecom case, there was evidence before the court that the scheme was likely to be recognized in the US. And in fact, it has been recognized under chapter 15 of the US bankruptcy code. I'll explain what US chapter 15 is. So we're not hypocritical. We will modify foreign law governed debt if there's evidence that the relevant foreign jurisdiction will accept, will accept that. Okay, and I'll come back to that point a bit later. Um, I'll just say something about the scheme of arrangement procedure, and this ties in with the previous question about how the scheme procedure works. Um, well, what a scheme procedure? Well, it's basically a compromise arrangement between a company and its creditors and or its members, the shareholders, with some element of give and take on both sides. It's basically a three-stage process. First, there's an application to court to convene relevant meetings of members and or creditors. Okay, so there has to be an application to the court. Secondly, relevant class meetings are held and the scheme must be approved by 75% in value and a majority of in number of creditors or members within the class. So that's the second stage, the class meeting stage. And the third stage is that the scheme comes before the court for approval. And I said, the English courts are flexible. The English courts have to be satisfied that the scheme proposed is a reasonable one, such that a reasonable member of the class concerned could have voted for it. The court, however, isn't a rubber stamp. However, it must be satisfied that the scheme proposed is a reasonable one, but not that it's the only fair one. So the courts 
there's boundaries of reasonableness. So, so long as the scheme is fair, the court is not saying it's the only fair scheme, but it's saying it is fair. Okay, let's just talk about, we talked about class composition. Well, some people say the English are very concerned with class. Everything depends on what class you're in. Well, I don't necessarily accept that's true, but um, people have had this stereotype at the Brits, very concerned about classes. And at this scheme of arrangement procedure, members are, or and or creditors are put into separate classes. And what determines whether you you're, should be part of a separate class? Um, well, I should point out to a difference with the Americans. Well, sometimes the Americans are better than the Brits. Sorry, that's the wrong statement. They're not better than the Brits, but they do things differently there. Like they don't play proper English sports like rugby and football. They play American sports like, I don't know what sport they play in America. Hockey and hockey and things like uh, American football and things like that. They're not real sports. Um, um, but, and the chapter 11 process, uh, the restructuring process in the United States under the US bankruptcy code is slightly different from the English process because Americans say, you guys don't have cross class cram down. And we say, well, we do have cr cram down, but it's not cross class cram down, whatever you Americans want to say. Um, cram down, what does cram down mean? Well, it's a very unpleasant metaphor. The idea comes from forcing somebody, forcing a plan or a, a restructuring down somebody's throat. Um, you know, forcing them to accept something even though they don't vote for it. So basically, in the UK, we have cram down. So a scheme becomes binding on creditors if 75% of creditors in terms of value vote for it. So not all the creditors have to vote for it, uh, but it's binding on creditors within the class. So we have cr crammed down in the UK within a class, within a class, but we don't have what the Americans call, we didn't have what's called cross-class cram down. In other words, a scheme can't be made binding on a class even though they didn't vote for it. So we have, we had cram down within a class. We didn't have cross class cram down. The American Bankruptcy Code does allow cross class cram down, provided certain conditions are satisfied. But traditionally in the UK, we didn't allow it. And I'll come back to that point later. Well, let's look at the issue of class composition, because, you know. <laughs> How, what determines whether you're in a separate class or not? Um, well, in the UK, there's a fairly extensive jurisprudence, and it's pretty well established that small differences in rights um, does not prevent creditors being placed in the same class. Um, you have to look at the rights of creditors in the absence of the scheme, and any new rights to which creditors become entitled under the scheme. You might say small differences, what does that mean? Well, it's somewhat loose and vague. The court has said, Is, are these differences, does it make it impossible for different groups to come together with a view to their common interest? So in other words, do the differences outweigh the similarities. <laughs> it's a bit vague, but that's it, that's it. Do the differences outweigh the similarities? So in a sense, it's a broad approach, because if you say that there are small differences are, uh, are allowed, it means that um, if you adopt that flexible approach, it means that a minority group of creditors don't have a veto. And what often happens in restructuring agreements at the moment now is you obviously, it's expensive to try to convene meetings of creditors and putting everything together because you've got to get financial advisors and all that sort of stuff. So often you kind of float the proposal to uh, 
creditors beforehand. And you have what are known as lockup agreements. In other words, creditors promise to, they lock themselves up to vote in favor of the restructuring um, by a certain date. And in return for this lockup agreement, um, they're given an inducement, so a, a small additional benefit. The question might arise, does that fracture the class? If you've got lock agree agreements, does that fracture the class? Well, the answer is no, it doesn't. Small differences, you know, small extra inducements doesn't fracture the class. That's deemed to be acceptable. Okay, so um, I said there's three stages. The second stage is the court, uh, is the meetings of creditors. The first stage is what's called in the UK the convening stage. And um, questions on class composition in the UK are settled at the convening stage. Um, and then after the class meetings are held, whether online or in person, nowadays maybe more or less online now, which makes it easier, um, the third stage is the matter comes before the court for what's known as the sanctioning stage. Uh, I once did a presentation. Yeah. yeah. Can I just ask a question about the lockup? So you said in the lockup, you give something to the class, and then you can say, Yeah, you, you, ba you basically say to some, somebody, a creditor, look, if you promise to vote and in favor, you'll get a small additional payment. If you vote to, in favor by a certain date, so we don't have to reach the, the date at which the meetings are held. If you agree in advance to vote, you'll get a small additional payment. And that's not a vote by agreement? Say that again? Is that not considered vote by? No, no, no. <laughs> no. Well, it's deemed to be acceptable. But what's the, like, when does it cross the line? You are answering too many difficult questions. Uh, uh, I don't know is the answer. Uh, because people kind of think about it. If you get maybe 2 or 3%, that's OK. But the courts have never had to consider the issue of 5% or 10% or 20%. So probably these are worked out. <laughs> and uh, the court have never really said, ne never really addressed the issue you've addressed. You asked too many difficult questions. We prefer to deal with it discreetly. Um, so good question, but um, not sure the answer, because nobody really has said, what's the line? Um, OK. What about the role of the court at the third stage? Well, that's called the sanctioning stage. Uh, the word sanction can mean two different things in English. In one sense, it means punishing somebody, sanction. But at this stage, it's actually used in the legislation for approving the scheme. So maybe some words are in English have a somewhat nuanced meaning. Sanctioning here means approving the scheme. And what's about the role of the court? Well, people have said, the court must be satisfied that statutory provisions have been observed. The relevant class was fairly represented by those attending the meeting. The statutory majority, over, i.e. 75% in value, were acting bona fide and not coercing the minority in order to promote interests adverse to those of the class they purport to represent. Um, fourthly, that an intelligent and honest person a member of the class concerned and acting in respect of its own interest might reasonably approve the scheme. Fifthly, that there's no blot on the scheme. What do you mean a blot? Well, a blot is meaning you leave too many things out, out, outside. So in other words, if really the scheme depends on the tax authorities agreeing future agreements to pay, uh, future agreements to accept um, payments over time, that's, you might say that's a blot on the scheme because nobody knows whether the scheme will actually work, what the, um, 
sixthly, um, um, the court should not act in vain. So um, the court will need evidence that the scheme will achieve international recognition if necessary. So you have to produce evidence that the scheme is likely to produce benefits for creditors. Um, and just to go back to one of the earlier points, the bona fide point, the need is for class members to be voting in the interests of the class and not in their own specific interests if they are different from the interests of the class. Um, I remember uh, somebody in Singapore gave this example. Let's assume um, you're proposing some scheme, but you vote against the scheme because you've got a huge amount of property in your personal capacity very close and you don't want the scheme to go ahead because you're thinking of your own interests as a nearby landowner. You think, no way do I want the scheme to go ahead uh, because it's going to damage my interests as a landowner uh, to uh, somebody who owns a neighboring property. Okay. What about out of the money creditors? Out of the money means, because let's assume there's debt. We've got a debt structure. Some creditors are paid ahead of others. And let's assume the company only has a small pot of money and some creditors are out of the money. They will not um, get anything if a company goes into liquidation, into a formal insolvency process. Um, well, as we've seen, schemes involve division of creditors into classes and getting court approval. But it's only necessary to get the consent of those with an economic interest in the proposed restructuring. So a scheme can be used to squeeze out mezzanine creditors. Well, this is a little bit complicated, so I might run over time if I talk about this for too long. Um, basically, what might happen under a scheme is that assets are transferred to a new company along with so some liabilities of the creditors who are in the money, right? So the scheme involves transfer of assets and transfers of claims of certain creditors. And out of the money creditors are less stranded with claims against the old company, which no longer has any assets. You might say, that looks a bit dodgy, doesn't it? Surely can, can that be done? Um, well, the problem might be, on a practical level, that all the creditors have security or charges over assets, but there is what's known as a security trustee who needs to give its consent. And you might say, is the company really out of the money? Is the company in the money? Are creditors out of the money? Are they in the money? Um, well, the court considers overall fairness at the sanctioning hearing. And obviously, valuation questions are important. Where does the value break? What's the relevant comparator? Um, these, um, these kind of schemes are usually, were usually imp implemented as part of a prepackaged administration. And I'll give you an example of a cram down scheme. Um, the Noble Group case. This was a case where the court sanctioned the scheme proposed by a holding company of a major glo global commodities trading group, the Noble Group, that was incorporated in Bermuda but listed in Singapore. The assets were transferred to the new company with scheme creditors receiving 20% of the equity in the new group. Existing shareholders were left with 20% and management were left with 10% of the shares in the new company. Um, it was held by the court, the English court, in sanctioning the scheme that the value in the group essentially belonged to the scheme creditors, and it was up to them, the scheme creditors, to divide it up in the restructuring, including offering equity to existing shareholders and to management. Um, there were subordinated creditors who didn't receive anything. You might say, surely that's not fair. Subordinated creditors are not receiving anything. 
And surely creditors should get paid ahead of equity holders and get paid, of equ uh, paid ahead of management. That's what the Americans call a violation of the absolute priority rule. Well, we Brits, we don't like this absolute priority rule. It's too absolute. Um, um, well, the English court sanctioned the scheme. It approved the scheme. But there were regulatory issues in, in Singapore. Why? You might say, well, because shareholders only left with 20% of the equity in the new group. And the Singapore authorities kicked up a bit of a, st a stink because they said, look, this company was listed in Singapore and Singaporeans were encouraged to buy shares in the company, the fact that it was listed in Singapore, and now they're left only with 20% of the equity in the group. Some people say they shouldn't be left with anything of the equity at all. But on the other hand, you obviously the Singapore government quite likely has to respond to the concerns of the constituents. So they did encourage people to buy shares in the company. Uh, and they're basically only left with 20% of the shares in the new company, whereas previously they had 100%. Um, so bit of controversy in Singapore there. So I'm not saying schemes. Well, they do obviously give rise to uh, concerns. OK, I was critical of America before, wasn't I? Impliedly, at least. Um, but the Americans are good in certain res Well, uh, I'm not saying they're totally bad well, uh, in, so in some respects. Well, I did mention a word about Britain leaving the EU. And I mentioned that Britain likes to see itself as at the forefront of international insolvency developments and at the forefront of Europe in terms of being a financial center. And surely Brexit is bad news. Well, I'm not saying, I'm look, I'm not a political person, so I'm not going to go into controversy. I'm not going to talk is Brexit good or bad, but Obviously, Britain wants to be still global Britain. So, um, so obviously, it has to project an international image. And we obviously had COVID as well. So Britain, British law has to be kept up to date. So major changes were introduced in UK law by the Corporate Governance of Insolvency Act 2020. It, it was marketed by the government as a response to COVID-19. But the changes were considered long before then. Well, basically, um, the UK Insolvency Service said, um, the cram down of a rescue plan on out of the money creditors is currently possible in the UK, as I explained, but didn't explain everything. But it's costly because you need a scheme of arrangement. And all it tends to be in practice, you need a, uh, an administration. But UK has to develop a more sophisticated restructuring procedure with the ability to cram down, which may facilitate more restructuring and the subsequent survival of the corporate entity as a going concern. So we had these changes introduced. And you could say, look, I criticized America impliedly, but these changes bring UK law into more in line with the US chapter 11. And they also bring UK law more into line with the changes envisaged by the EU restructuring directive. Obviously, Britain doesn't have to implement it because it's no longer an EU member state, but we still say we're better than those in the rest of Europe, so we're at the forefront. Um, um, OK, let's. So um, what does chapter, what does this um, Corporate Governance and Solvency Act 2020 do? Well, it permits cross-class cram down uh, in certain circumstances. I won't go into it in some extent, circumstances are where cross-class cram down is permitted. So we borrowed, borrowed certain features from the US chapter 11, chapter 11 of the US Bankruptcy Code. But let's go back to um, restructuring of foreign debt. I said, is UK law 
uh, two-faced. No, of course it's not. You might criticize, but of course it's not two-faced. Uh, why do Americans say that UK law is a bit two-faced? Well, as I said, there's a long established principle that the discharge or modification of a debt under foreign law will not be given effect to in the UK where the contract creating the debt is governed by UK law. That's known as the Gibbs principle. Because to put it in other words, the foreign law is not the law of a country which the contract belongs or one which the contracting parties can be taken to have agreed to be bound. It's the law of another country which they've agreed not to be bound by. Um, but the Gibbs rule is under attack by saying, well, surely it kind of protects the position of the UK. Is it not parochial and narrow-minded? Because it's got its, to use more legalistic language, the Gibbs rule has its exclusive focus on bilateral contractual regime to the neglect of more multilateral universalist concerns. Um, so the Gibbs rule is under attack from those advocating a more universalist approach towards the restructuring of debt obligations. Um, the question might be, should the Gibbs rule survive? The UK obviously wants to project its international image. So sometimes Americans say, you Brits are hypocrites, parochial, narrow-minded. But of course we're not. Should the Gibbs rule survive? Well, the UK wants to um, preserve its position as a center for international de debt restructuring. And you could say the Gibbs rule does preserve the UK because basically if there's a, if there's a UK governed debt obligation, its modification has to be done under, under UK law. So, so long as there are international debt obligations um, governed by UK law, the restructuring should be done in the UK, or at least there should be a parallel scheme in the UK. So surely that's a bit mm, protectionist. Should, so, so those advocating a more universalist approach say it's a bit too protectionist, it shouldn't survive. Well, the UK Insolvency Service wants to kind of remove this suspicion, I call it suspicion, of being too protectionist. Um, and it seems that it may survive as a UK residual common law principle, but its application in the UK um, will be cut back because the UK has what's known as the Uncertral Model Law on Insolvency. But there's a new Uncertral Model Law on insolvency related judgments. So the question is, should that be implemented in the UK? And if it's implemented in the UK, will it involve cutting back, um, cutting back the Gibbs rule? Because in America, they might say, well, the Unstral model law has been implemented in America through chapter 15 of the US bankruptcy code, and they don't have this Gibbs rule. Um, because we saw from the Magyar Telecoms case. So if the UK does implement the Unstral model law, and as I said, the insolvency service is consulting on this at the moment, should it remove or cut back or abolish the Gibbs rule? Well, as I said, it's been consulted upon at the moment. So uh, the UK insolvency service is fairly cautious, saying it should survive to some extent, but we leave the door open for future developments. So we're not, we're leaving the door open. Um, and the question might be, what should other states do? Well, thank you very much indeed. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor McCormick.